Hello, everybody. My name is Roger Hartle. I'm professor of neurosurgery and director of spinal surgery at Weill Cornell Medicine here in New York. And it is my great pleasure, together with the co-directors of the Weill Cornell Center for Comprehensive Spine Care, to welcome you to our webinar on pandemic pain, helping you help your patients with back and neck issues. I want to thank Tatiana and Roseanne from the Department of Neurosurgery who really make this webinar uh, happening today. And uh, I want to thank you for your time that you're dedicating to this educational event. We'll talk a lot about pain, obviously, but also a lot about telemedicine, given the pandemic and all the changes that have taken us by surprise and have significantly altered the way that we practice medicine. And before we get into the presentation, uh, I would like to do a quick poll, and I would like to ask you a question, Tatiana, if we uh, can just pull up the, uh, the poll questions, please. I would like to ask you a question about how comfortable are you using telemedicine to evaluate a patient's back or neck problems? And you have, uh, you'll see you have multiple choices, very comfortable, a little comfortable, not really comfortable, or not at all comfortable. I'll give you um, a minute or so to uh, pick your choices. And I think we'll take it here. So uh, I'll share uh, the results with you. So it's a mixed picture. Some of you are pretty comfortable, which is great. And, um, but some of you, as you can see, are not comfortable at all. And uh, I hope that we'll be able, together with our specialists here, to uh, shift this, uh, these results all towards very comfortable and help you really take good care of these patients, even if it's virtual. So I'll, um, uh, I will get rid of this and we'll get started with our presentation. Now, as you know, the, the Spine Center, and, and some of you are familiar probably with what we do, the work uh, that we do is interdisciplinary. And it is interdisciplinary because there are so many reasons why people can have back and neck problems. Uh, we have uh, today uh, uh, Ricky Singh, who is uh, the head of uh, uh, rehabilitation medicine at the Spine Center. He's going to talk to us about telemedicine. We have uh, uh, Dr. Neil Mehta who's the head of pain management at, at the Spine Center. He's gonna talk about some of the treatment options that you have uh, if you use telemedicine, but also beyond that. And then Josh Weaver from Neurology, who's gonna to talk to us about complementary medicine and integrative health. And um, obviously beyond that, we have a, a, a variety of other specialists. And we cover really in the Spine Center, we cover virtually every, every uh, every uh, portion of spinal pathology. It starts with degenerative changes, tumors, uh, trauma, infection, uh, deformity, and so forth. And in order to do that, we have collaborations with a number of different uh, specialists. We work with uh, very closely with integrative health. Uh, we work with muscle specialists such as Neil and uh, Neil Mehta and Norman Marcus run a program on muscle-generated pain. We work very closely, obviously, with physical therapy. But we also offer psychology and cognitive behavioral or access to that type of care, primarily through Robert Allen, who's been working with us for many years. We have a great surgical uh, team, uh, Eric Alowitz, Ali Baj, uh, Mike Virk, and, um, and Kai Fu cover really all aspects of spinal surgery. As a spine center, we have certain areas that we pride ourselves in. Uh, in terms of subspecialization, and that is regenerative, bi you know, biological approaches to spinal degenerative problems, minimal invasive spinal surgery, but also complex spinal surgery and tumors. So uh, we are located on the f on uh, 50, uh, 59th Street at the corner of 2nd Avenue. Again, uh, the, and the, our basic premise is really that spinal pathology is really affected by virtually every other body system and everything can have an impact on spinal health and vice versa. And therefore it is important to really approach patients in an interdisciplinary and, and very comprehensive uh, approach. Now this has obviously now been significantly affected due to the current health crisis. Uh, patients stay at home much more, they work from home. Uh, the amount of physical activity uh, that patients can really 
uh, do has uh, significantly diminished and there's a lot of expert uh, opinion and there are some expert recommendations out there. Some may be more helpful than others, but I hope that we'll be able to give you uh, really top advice from our co-directors today. Uh, the Zoom stock has gone up, as you can see here, and, and our webinar is a good example for that. Fortunately, people also exercise at home. Uh, as you can see here, Peloton stock has gone up. For those of you who have an interest uh, in, in investments, maybe consider something like that. But we have to realize that uh, what the changes that we're seeing now, a lot of those changes will go on. And that means that a large proportion of our workforce will continue to work from home and that will have a significant impact, especially for those of us who specialize in back and neck problems. Because what happens obviously when you work at home, uh, the access to physical therapy is not there. Uh, you exercise in general less, which can have an impact on back and neck problems. Uh, but even the incidence of uh, blood clots and carpal tunnel and all those occupational problems that are related to uh, patients spending more time at home and working from home, all these things uh, deteriorate and, and the incidence may go up. There's limited access to care. A lot of patients are frankly afraid of going to the hospital because of what's going on right now. Physical therapy is not available, but we'll, we'll give you some options though later on. The gyms are closed and then obviously together this may all affect nutrition and lifestyle. What we want to do today is really we want to try to help you assess the situation for your patients and then give valid and really helpful recommendations to those patients. And that's why we brought uh, these experts together here for this uh, webinar. So we wanna help you figure out how to assess patients via telemedicine, give them valid advice in terms of initial treatment options, home remedies. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about integrative and complementary therapies. That's uh, with Dr. Josh Weaver. Uh, but we also want to make sure that there are certain red flags and certain reasons why you may want to send your patient still to the hospital or to the spine center. And we're here for you. And uh, the way that uh, we have structured it now, we're here for you in a very safe environment. And we'll talk about that a little bit further ahead as well. What have we done in the spine center to make sure that your patients are being treated uh, effectively, but also safely? We have decreased the overall volume of patients that we see, but we'll make up for that by telemedicine. Uh, we screen patients on the telephone before at, uh, getting them into the spine center to make sure that they are asymptomatic. We encourage patients to do e-check-ins from home or once they're in the spine center, they can e-check in as well. We, we, we screen temperatures in the lobby in these patients. Obviously, we adhere to all the precautionary um, uh, inter uh, things such as uh, the PPEs, wearing masks, gloves, hand sanitizers are available, and so forth. We clean all the patient rooms very thoroughly between appointments, and uh, we adjusted the traffic flow in the spine center so patients walk uh, in one direction so there's no... Uh, bumping into other patients or, uh, you know, the social distance can be maintained. And finally, I want to give you again our contact information. Uh, we're open uh, starting next week. Uh, if you have uh, any uh, patients that you would like to send us, uh, you know how to get hold of us. This is also shown again on this slide. Uh, global patients as well are obviously welcome. And uh, I put the contact information for global patients here as well. If you have any problems getting patients in or access, feel free to email me or call me directly and I'll make sure that we get your patients in. And are there any questions? For those of you who have questions, there is a function uh, where you can raise your hand and Roseanne and Tatiana are monitoring that and they'll, we'll, uh, uh, if, if there is sufficient time, we'll be happy to address your questions. There's also a chat function here if you, if you want to write questions. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, what we will do is we will send out uh, the slide deck to you by email so you have all the contact information. And again, if you have any questions later on, you can obviously contact us by email or telephone anytime. Uh, Roseanne or Tatiana, is there any question that I should address quickly? Or if they're not, then we'll move ahead with Dr. Singh, who's going to talk about telemedicine. Mm, 
Uh, you guys can hear me okay? Yes. Uh, yeah, so thanks for that introduction. Again, there are, there are options to ask questions, keep this interactive, uh, either raising your hand or via the chat box. Uh, I am encouraged by the poll results. You know, we were initially concerned that if everyone was very comfortable treating patients with back pain via telemedicine, then our talk would be somewhat useless today. We could have just gone home early, but I'm glad that we can share some information um, with you all uh, on this topic. You know, so telemedicine really took off for us at Wall Cornell and New York Presby last summer. Uh, we started seeing patients uh, virtually, either through telephones and video. We use our electronic health system, Epic, uh, at Wall Cornell. We also use Doximity and DocSeeMe as other options. Uh, sometimes it's technically challenged to get these patients connected, but we have found more creative ways uh, to engage patients to see them virtually, which is really helpful. You know, telemedicine is somewhat different than telehealth in that medicine, telemedicine is where we're actually seeing the patients and delivering care directly to them. Whereas telehealth is more health promotion and education, and we also want to be on the forefront of delivering this type of care uh, to our patients, to your patients as well, because prevention is gonna be a big part of the game going forward, especially after this pandemic or throughout it. We want to make sure patients are staying healthy. The biggest thing with telemedicine for back pain is how, are you, how can you effectively evaluate these patients? You know, one of the big concerns, if a patient calls the office with a certain complaint, whether it's neck, back, or even joint pain, is how can I confidently evaluate that patient, come up with a differential, differential diagnosis, um, order treatments such as imaging, medications, and exercises. And I think we're gonna learn more as as we evolve with delivering care virtually, we're gonna learn about how to diagnose uh, safely, and then when patients should be seen urgently in the office. Some of the things that we try to accomplish here are the technical aspects of it, having a high quality webcam, having audio, as you can see, Dr. Hartle's wearing the headset. It minimizes feedback and things like that, so patients really feel like you're engaged. The other thing is trying to make Maintain eye contact. It's very easy to get distracted virtually. You can have multiple monitors open. Uh, you can have your cell phone here and doing many, many different things. But really trying to keep the patient and yourself engaged in that visit is very, very important. And then when to establish follow-up care, uh, when it's appropriate to have another virtual visit down the line or to send for imaging, interventions, therapies, and things like that. One of the things that we have tried to learn is what's the optimal distance a patient should sit back from their computer or phone so you can see the full body. And that's important when looking at back pain. Um, you know, as you can see, if I'm this close, it's really tough to, for me to show you where my pain is. Uh, so we often have the patient set their phone or laptop on their table and then take a few feet back, steps back from this camera. We found that seven to eight feet is pretty optimal. You can still hear the patient, but also you're able to visualize their entire body look at their range of motion, assess strength, and things like that. So keep that in mind uh, when you're speaking with a patient. I wanted to just go over a quick case, someone actually I saw uh, yesterday virtually. Um, this was a patient, a young man with no significant past medical history, uh, has back pain, worse with walking, worse in the morning, uh, better with wet rest and better with heat. He describes that the pain is uh, somewhat somewhat better when he sits down and when he's talking and doing Zoom meetings, uh, but when he's walking around, it hurts a little bit more. So here are some of the things that I went over on his virtual physical exam. Number one, I just wanted to assess his range of motion. How does he look when he's bending and extending back? Could I appreciate any uh, pain or discernible pain in his face when he's doing those maneuvers? One of the maneuvers we do a lot in the office is a standing stork test or an extension test. And this is also a way to provoke a patient's symptoms if I think the pain is coming from certain regions of the spine, especially uh, the posterior elements like the facet joints or even some of the muscles of the back. Because we're sitting a lot, a lot of us are getting really, really tight hips. The piriformis is getting tight. The sacroiliac joint can sometimes get involved. Uh, so this is a kind of a modified seated favors test where you have the patient flex the hip, externally rotate and abduct, um, and if pain is reproduced in the buttock region, you might think it's a sacroiliac joint issue or piriformis issue. Uh, just another quick trick. 
Uh, slump set test, this gets a little more challenging with patients, especially if they're sitting on a couch. Uh, so I have them try to either sit on a table or sit on a few pillows uh, so that their feet are dangling. And I just walk them through this step. It's bring your chin down to your chest, punching your spine and extending one leg. And if patients report that it's reproducing shooting pain down the leg, then I'm thinking more of a sciatica or radicular type of pain. Um, and I can guide my treatment that way. Sensory exam, you know, we can't discriminate between soft touch and pinprick all the time. So just kind of a crude way is to ask the patient to touch certain areas of their foot and how does it feel compared to the contralateral side. Um, so here are some of the dermatomes, L4, L5, and S1. Probably the most commonly affected nerve roots when patients have back pain. And in addition to that, testing their strength is very important and something they can do on their own. Uh, walking on your heels can effectively test L4 and some of L5. Um, if you wanted better tests for L5, you can have the patient stand on inverted feet or do a single leg squat. Um, and then S1, walking on their toes is really effective. You know, one thing to obviously be considerate of, if this is an elder adult or someone with some um, mobility issues, you don't want them to fall. So having someone in their house close by to protect them or having a piece of furniture nearby uh, so they don't fall would be very important. Uh, so this patient, again, had back pain, no radiation. Uh, I performed that stork test on them with the extension based. That was positive. They said that reproduced their pain. The slump test was negative, so I wasn't thinking of any neurologic issues or disc herniation. So I'm thinking this is a lumbar strain. It could be coming from the facets. And so I want to start talking about their exercise program, how they're staying active. And, you know, especially in physical medicine rehabilitation, it really comes down to mobility. You know, we, we tout that movement is medicine. And during this crisis, it's very tough for patients to go out and exercise. Gyms are closed. You know, soul cycle is closed. Again, Dr. Hartle mentioned Peloton. But Peloton's not that great either, especially for patients with disc problems. Just sitting down and compressing the disc is not ideal. Bracing can be helpful, uh, just supporting some of the muscles of the spine. But again, I want to be a little cautious of that, with that as well, because I don't want the brace to do the work of the core muscles. Uh, but sometimes it can be helpful just to get the mobility going initially. One thing that we're seeing a lot is what Dr. Hoddle mentioned, is we're working on a computer a lot. And most of us right now, listening to this Zoom, are probably sitting at their desk or sitting on their phone. It's actually a ploy for us to get more patients to have you participate in this webinar with us. Um, but, you know, a lot of us don't have ergonomically adjusted stations at home, like we do at work. So our shoulders are going forward, our, we're hunching a little bit, we get a lot of neck and upper back strain. So really stretching out the pecs and increasing the range of motion of the shoulders, squeezing those shoulder blades together are very, very important. Um, something you can tell your patients and even practice yourself as we're gonna do more and more virtual medicine. It's gonna be very important to keep things pretty flexible. Things that you guys already probably know when to send for, uh, for imaging or when we should probably see them. I mean, if there's a history of cancer, bowel or bladder incontinence, and elder adults who may be at a slip and fall, you might be thinking of a fracture. Um, if there's weakness that's progressing, if they're declining functionally, obviously these are things that they should probably be seen urgently. Uh, like we mentioned, we are opening for business um, in person next week. Uh, so if there are patients that we need to see, even patients that we've seen virtually, we're having them come back in so we can actually do a proper neurologic exam in person. Um, and again, like I mentioned earlier, when, when to, it's appropriate to see us in the Spine Center, um, we're here to help. We want to take care of your patients and our patients virtually. Uh, so I will pause there, see if there's any questions. Again, you can type them into the chat box. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to introduce Dr. Neil, or Dr. Hartle is going to introduce Dr. Neil Mehta. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, yeah, Neil Mehta is the uh, uh, pain medicine chief, really, in the Spine Center, as most of you uh, know. He's uh, an expert in uh, uh, pain management procedures. He has a special interest in muscle medicine, which is really exciting. And he's going to talk about some of the home remedies, initial therapies that you can consider for your patients. Neil, thanks for doing this. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harrell, and, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's been an interesting time, to say the least. And we have seen um, a fair amount of changes <clears throat> in our practice. So I put together the type of patients that we had been seeing once COVID-19 sort of erupted. 
And the most common conditions really don't differ that much from what we see day to day, even pre-COVID. Uh, a lot of new muscular strains, herniated discs, people with more time on their hands that are seeing uh, opportunity to uh, exercise more and getting some exercise related injuries, including uh, tailbone pain sitting on the Peloton, which has probably been the most common. Uh, and then uh, under stress, under other reasons, uh, eruption of shingles. Uh, and then those that are with chronic pain uh, now have some time to address it. And we're seeing a, a wide range of pain uh, syndromes there. So where do we start? Uh, we start with treatments over video visit. Uh, and that can start with telephysical therapy. Uh, both New York Presbyterian and many private groups in the New York area are offering telehealth for, for physical therapy. And some physical therapists, uh, when they screen, are able to decide if an initial session should be done in person, taking a lot of the same precautions that we take in the spine center. And then we, we talk about various medication therapies, and when needed, we set up patients uh, for injections for intractable pain. So physical therapy is generally about 30 to 60 minute sessions, uh, three times a week, one-on-one -on -one with the patient. Uh, in fact, the patient gave me some feedback in that when they transitioned from regular physical therapy to telehealth, they found that they were spending much more time with their therapist than uh, before. So it hasn't, hasn't really changed uh, the positive response that physical therapy uh, can provide. Uh, it gets covered with insurance and, and there's no additional co-pays there. Medications, uh, we, we've used a wide range there from the basic of NSAIDs and acetaminophen, muscle relaxers, and oral steroids may come into play if the pain is pretty severe and we're still trying to avoid uh, a patient visiting our office now or, or worse at urgent care or emergency room. And then there's topical agents that can be used as well. Injection therapy is when things are pretty severe for patients. And in the time that we've been uh, essentially treating emergency patients, we have done trigger points for severe pain. We've done epidural steroids uh, injections like we've done in the past, mainly for acute or acute on chronic pain conditions. An epidural steroid has its limitations, but it has good body of evidence for use in the acute situation, especially like disc herniations or acute flares, flares of uh, spinal stenosis. As Dr. Singh mentioned, patients have been experiencing uh, sacroiliac joint or buttock related pains. So we've done some procedures there. We had a postpartum patient that also experienced that. Uh, we've treated headache-related pains, intractable headache uh, due to occipital nerve uh, entrapment. And then coccidinia or coccyx pain treated with a ganglion of impar steroid injection. To treat condition-based uh, myofascial pain, we first start with over-the-counter medications, things that they may already have in their home and have uh, minimize the need to leave the house. So that it could be a leave ibuprofen, uh, acetaminophen. But if necessary, we have been prescribing uh, further NSAIDs. And there has been some controversy about NSAID therapy initially in COVID time, but a lot of that has been uh, revised to be uh, recommending still use of NSAIDs when needed. Muscle relaxants, tizanidine or cyclobenzapine have been useful. Uh, tizanidine is a great way to start. It sort of has lower levels of sedation. And then we've done some topical creams compounded uh, with high concentrations of lidocaine, diclofenac, or ketamine that can be useful and pretty minimal in terms of side effects. There is some cost to this, but it's, it's been manageable for most patients. We use cold and warm compresses, and I've often encouraged patients to uh, purchase a TENS unit off of Amazon and use that for about 20 minutes at a time. Uh, and we've brought some patients in for office trigger points if severe. Herniated discs, uh, as we talked about, can, can be treated with NSAIDs and acetaminophen. And we've used oral steroids, which initially were controversial in the time of, of COVID, but uh, again, has, has been um, rectified and, and changed so that it can be used again. 
And I've done some limited prescriptions of tramadol as initial therapy for severe cases. We did have a few patients that were in, in severe pain and we were able to find MRI centers that were safely able to provide MRIs for these patients. And then they went on to have epidural steroids. There's been a fair amount of new exercise routines being implemented for patients as they uh, look for alternatives to gyms. And, and so we are seeing an increase in both myofascial and sciatica pain, but also coccidinia and seated work environments leading to uh, uh, that <clears throat> as well. So we've done coccyx injections as we've talked about. And we have seen some patients that fortunately have come out of the hospital, including the ICU, where they've been deconditioned. They have various arthralgias, arthralgias and myalgias, some pressure sores that we've been treating with topical and other uh, arrangements. And then we uh, have seen patients that were on heavy opioids for sedation during their ICU stay that we have worked on trying to uh, improve and, and reduce their opioid use uh, post-discharge. So to uh, refer to the spine center, it's really when pain is more severe, uh, sort of beyond the usual course of time that it takes to heal. Uh, a decrease in functional mobility and any sort of concerning neurologic deficits, and furthermore, guidance on medication use. And we are here for you, as, as we mentioned, video visits will still remain a, a key portion and uh, the office will be reopening next week. Thank you very much. Great, Neil, thank you so much. I, uh, I wanna ask you a question before we move on to Josh's presentation. Maybe you and, 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 and Ricky as well. You know, it's easy to say, you know, you have to do telemedicine, they have myofascial pain, or they may have herniated disc. But from your clinical perspective, you know, a, a, a doctor who, uh, a general practitioner who evaluates these patients in the office or via video, what are like the big, the big uh, things to look at? Differentiating myofascial pain, which may be totally benign, versus uh, uh, pain related to spinal instability from tumor or infection that, that would really be more like a red flag and that would be something that we would like to have that uh, doctor refer. But what are like the big things that you look at? Well, I, I think the key, the key thing is, is the history. Uh, you know, when we, when we see a new patient, uh, the history of cancer, the history of some sort of constitutional symptom for infection, uh, trauma, uh, things like that would, would make us concerned that we'd want further uh, evaluation, whether it's in the office or imaging, as opposed to a patient that describes the history of, I was in good health and then I've started using my bike more and I've noticed that I'm experiencing pain there or a patient that reports that she was lifting her dog out of a bathtub and, uh, and now uh, is experiencing pain. So I think the history is, is really what we're gonna rely on even more so than in the old days when we could trust our physical exams a little bit more. Right. Then obviously whenever there's a real concern or uncertainty, you know, again, we're, we're, we're here for you and we, we're happy to give you advice and or see those patients. Now, Ricky, uh, just maybe from you, one or two sentences. Somebody comes in with leg pain. What, what do you, how do you make a diagnosis via telemedicine? It's a, is it a herniated disc or is it lumbar spinal stenosis? Yeah, I, uh, just like what Neil said, I think a lot of it's based on the history. Some of the exam maneuvers that I presented can really help you separate the difference between a radicular type of pattern due to a disc herniation or foraminal stenosis versus lumbar stenosis. You know, even that stork test that I showed, even though it's classically used to, to uh, diagnose facet pain or posterior element pain, if during that maneuver a patient describes shooting pain down a leg, uh, then you might be thinking that a nerve is being compressed in the foramen as it exits. Uh, the other thing of when, when things are not looking great is just the natural time history of this back condition. You know, we've seen it in our clinic that most of the time these back pains and, and even radicular pains get better. Uh, so I think, you know, if I was a general practitioner or a primary care doc, I would comfortably manage a lot of this on my own. But if it's not getting better in the natural time course that I'm anticipating, I think that's an appropriate time to refer uh, to the spine center. 
What about imaging? When, what's your cutoff for imaging? When, when should somebody get an MRI scan? You know, there are so many studies, especially in public health, about how over imaging and getting an MRI too soon doesn't lead to a better outcome, which we can certainly see. We try to the best of our ability to manage this conservatively. Try also medications to help with the inflammation and pain. Start with some exercises. If that's not getting better over a course of four to six weeks and or there is a neurologic deficit such as weakness, um, I think that's the right time to get some pictures. Because it, you know, my decision making of, in terms of getting an image is what am I gonna do with that information? Am I going to inject or am I gonna to refer to you, Dr. Hartle, for a surgery? And if I'm not thinking either one of those things, then I'm gonna hold off as long as I can getting some imaging. I got it. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll move on. Josh Weaver is our esteemed neurologist in the Spine Center, but today he's gonna to talk more about complementary and integrative health, which is one of his special interests. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, um, Dr. Harper, for that introduction. Just get this up here. And thanks everyone for joining our, um, our webinar. <clears throat> so as Dr. Hartle mentioned, um, I am a neurologist at the Spine Center. And part of what I'm going to do today is just go over how to evaluate a patient neurologically um, uh, via telemedicine. Uh, but I also have fellowship training in integrative medicine. Um, and I found over the years that approaching a patient with a more, um, with a more holistic approach has been really beneficial. Um, looking at other aspects of their life that could contribute to their pain, I think has been really helpful. So I'm gonna go over some of those things that we can do via telemedicine that all doctors can do, um, but might be missed. Um, so first of all, just a neurological evaluation. A lot of this is overlapped with what um, we've, already, we've already mentioned. Um, you know, getting a neurological history, talking about the characteristics of the pain, but particularly from my standpoint as a neurologist, um, you know, talking about associated symptoms, uh, numbness, tingling, weakness, bowel or bladder changes, that all um, leads to determining whether or not there are red flags, how severe the problem could be, um, and if we need to go further with any diagnostic testing. Uh, the examination is similar to what we described before. Um, normally in person, I would do a much fuller neurological examination over telemedicine, particularly for neck and back pain, it's really strength, sensation, and gait, um, and range of motion that I think are the most important. Um, diagnostic evaluations in certain situations, labs may be ordered. Uh, imaging, such as x-rays or MRIs, as we just discussed, may be necessary if there are neurological symptoms um, you know, associated with the pain. And often uh, in the office, electrodiagnostic testing, such as EMGs or nerve conduction studies, can be really helpful um, and, and next week, we will be starting that back up, um, as, as Dr. Hartle mentioned. All right. um, so just to, to discuss really quickly, um, what, I, what I've seen with a lot of patients um, that I've been doing via telemedicine since the pandemic started is that just people's stress levels are way higher you know, than they've been before. We've always had a lot of stressors in life, but this is really adding a whole new dimension to things. And, uh, you know, people have underlying depression and anxiety, and in, in the neurology world, we see this as comorbid conditions with neurological problems uh, all the time. But I think during the pandemic, you know, with social isolation and being at home, depression and anxiety is really um, uh, getting worse with a lot of people. So I think it's really important to discuss people's stressors, psychosocial stressors, uh, and their depression and their anxiety, because it really could contribute to their pain quite a bit. There's been a lot in the literature about stress and its role in inflammation in the body. Um, so I think it can actually physically add to, um, to inflammation of the nerves you know, in, and the joints in the neck and the back. Um, so in terms of oops, sorry about that, um, how to assess, there, these are some basic scales that most people are probably familiar with. Um, those of us who use Epic, I think these are actually built into Epic so you can use these. But for depression, the PHQ-9 uh, scale and anxiety, the generalized anxiety um, uh, scale you can use, um, these are the questions that are asked. It's a scale from zero to three, zero not at all, three all the time. Um, and you can get a, you know, for the PHQ-9, a, a, a number from zero to 27. That's a good way to kind of track it over time, but also to, just to get a sense of how bad is this depression? Um, is it really mild? Is it moderate? Is it really severe? And the same thing for the anxiety. And that can help you sort of figure out 
um, do I need to refer this person to a psychiatrist or can I, can we handle some things, you know, via the telemedicine calendar directly? In terms of how to help, what can we do for this? Um, I think in, in the setting of a pandemic, I think the best thing that doctors can do in any kind of doctor can provide reassurance to their patients um, that we're all going through this. It is hopefully a temporary thing um, that will continue to get better over time. Um, but we can also be there to provide guidance, not just for their pain, but I think for a lot of things. Um, I think a big thing that, that patients are seeing right now is there's a lack of their normal routine. There's a lack of structure to their day. People are going to bed at different times, waking up at different times. They're not, um, they're not having their meals at their regular times. Uh, and it really throws a lot of things off and adds to stress and anxiety and depression. And I think trying to develop uh, you know, reintroduce structure into a patient's life again and walk them through that can actually be really helpful. Discussing coping mechanisms can be really good. Um, a lot of people are drinking more alcohol, eating worse food um, or more food, um, binge watching Netflix, which I've been guilty of. Uh, but there's a lot of ways that we can kind of redirect people's coping mechanisms and, and, and introduce more positive coping mechanisms um, into their lives. Um, stress reduction techniques, I'm, gonna, I'm going to touch upon that on the next couple slides um, that I think can be really useful. Um, there's a lot of things out there that can work for people. And then, like I said, if things are more severe, we can refer people out to psychologists and psychiatrists. There's a lot of telepsychology that's going on right now, and I have some resources uh, for you on one of the slides as well. So one of the, the easiest uh, stress reduction techniques that I've found really useful is actually just deep breathing. It sounds very, very simple, but there's actually a lot of uh, literature on various deep breathing techniques and what it can do physiologically for the body. Um, there's a lot of um, studies that have shown that deep breathing can reduce stress, can reduce anxiety. But as you can see for some of those citations down there, there's, there are some that look at reducing uh, pain intensity and pain perception as well. This 478 is one that I like to use. Um, there's a lot of different techniques that are out there, but the essential, the gist of it is you sit comfortably, both feet on the ground, and basically you, um, you breathe in through the nose for a count of four, um, and then you hold it for a count of seven, and then you breathe out through your mouth for a count of eight. Um, these are not seconds, this is just a count. So if everyone wants to try it, we can do it really quickly. Um, so if everyone's sitting comfortably, we're just gonna go ahead. So you breathe in, one, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You do that four times, okay? So just that technique of doing it four times, you can have eyes open, eyes closed, um, doesn't really matter. But you do that four times and you do that twice a day. And if you do that every day, you get in the habit of doing this deep breathing technique, it actually can make physiological changes over time. And it sounds too, too simple to be true, but there are, you know, there are some data to, to provide um, evidence for that. Um, meditation and mindfulness are really, really important things that I try to bring up with, with any patient who has chronic pain, because I think it can make a big difference. Um, there are lots of different types of meditation and mindfulness um, interventions. I put down kind of the core things that are involved with any meditation practice, you know, having a quiet location, comfortable posture, focus of attention, um, either on a word or on an object or a body part or uh, your breath um, and having an open attitude. Uh, mindfulness interventions, that's the core things here about maintaining attention, um, non-judgmental acceptance. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, YouTube resources. There are apps that you can get for free, you know, free apps for meditation. Introduction and there are courses offered, um, you know, in New York, um, and I think even online that you can do, and you can direct your patients there. And then progressive relaxation is a is a type of meditation uh, where you you basically tense various muscles uh, for a certain amount of time and then relax those muscles. And you can kind of go head to toe throughout the body. And a lot of these things, all of these types of interventions can be really useful to reduce um, pain. Uh, so those are things you can bring up with your patients. Even if you're not an expert yourself, you can direct them uh, you know, to those resources. Exercise we've already talked about, so I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but you know, cardiovascular exercise, strength and core training, I think is really important. 
Um, yoga, I think, can be really helpful. Um, certain people who may be elderly or have too much pain may find that difficult, but even then there's chair yoga and there's other things you can do um, where even if you're limited, you can still do something and this can be really beneficial. And lastly, as I mentioned, the, the psychology and psychiatry referrals, um, I just, I'll leave you know, this page on for a second. There's a lot of text here, but these are really um, good resources that I think we can all use. Um, the first four bullet points there are just um, websites uh, and links that, that people can go to. You can give these out to your patients so that they can find psychiatrists, psychotherapists, support groups, um, you know, other mental health providers, um, and they can actually do this on their own. Um, at Cornell, uh, we do the first few, few tabs there under the Cornell resources are actually for Cornell staff, but the uh, Cornell psychiatry is also open to see patients. Um, patients who have a primary care doctor at Cornell can refer them uh, to the uh, psychiatry department and they can get you know, psychological help as well. And that is it. Thank you. Well, uh, doc Dr. Weaver, we have a question from Manuel Vasquez. Okay. Manuel, go ahead. Tell us where you're from and what your specialty is. Yeah. Manuel, Dr. Vasquez? There we go. Yeah, please go ahead again. You're... you're I think he's muted again. Yeah, I think he's muted somehow. I tried to unmute, but I wasn't able to. I think, uh, I think we're all trying to unmute him at the same time. And we're, no, okay. Now, <laughs> now he's really unmuted. <laughs> Dr. Vasquez, go ahead, please. No, he's muted. Maybe he's uh, muting himself. Well, anyway, when you have the question, just let us just talk. In the meantime, in the meantime, I have a question. Uh, <laughs> Josh, Dr. Weaver, you, you're the neurologist. Let's help us understand. Somebody walks into your office or one of our referring doctors, you know, does a telemedicine visit with a patient and the patient says he's got, he has had severe leg pain for the last two or three days and he notices that he has a foot drop. And indeed, he can barely walk because he can't lift up his right foot. So, uh, so how do you, what, what advice would you give that doctor and let's say that patient is 55 years old, otherwise healthy, severe leg pain, uh, a foot drop. What, what is your recommendation? Is there a need for an EMG? Is it pain, pain medication? What would you tell that, that, that uh, patient? Yeah, so I think, I think in that particular scenario, when someone comes in with just a few days of uh, foot drop, it's a little too early to do a nerve, uh, a nerve conduction study on that patient. It usually takes a few weeks to actually see changes on the nerve conduction study. So it would be premature to do that in most at this point. But having foot drop like that really is one of the red flags um, that we would worry about uh, in terms of assuming there's back pain um, radiating down the leg. Uh, associated with this foot drop, um, you know, we would evaluate which muscles were weak in the foot, but most likely that's coming from a pretty severe um, you know, nerve compression going on in the back. This would be one of those reasons you would want to do an MRI. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be a good recommendation. We we're certainly set up, obviously, to do that. Um, maybe I don't know, Dr. Vasquez, are you ready to ask the question? You can also type them in the chat room, and we can then. Yes, yes, uh, but are you hearing me right now? Yes, yeah, we can hear yes. you loud and clear. Okay. I'm, yes. I'm Manuel Vasquez so, uh, from Dominican Republic. Welcome. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, and I would like to ask to Dr. Sinch uh, about the overweight persons. Um, I have a situation that uh, one or or uh, once a year, I have a, a really back pain, but I, I know that I'm a, I am overweight. Uh, but it happens to me just uh, once a year or once, a, oh, or once a, a, any two years. This is uh, something to get 
uh, worry about it or, or not? That's yeah, it. that's a great question. You know, especially during this kind of self isolation, quarantine, stay at home orders, it's getting more and more challenging for our patients, myself included, to exercise. So weight gain has become an issue. You know, the, there have been some biomechanical studies that talk about back pain in relation to weight. And one of the things I tell a lot of my patients is for every pound extra that you've gained, kind of in your abdominal area, that's sometimes equal to seven to 10 pounds on the spine. So even five to 10 pounds extra in weight is a significant amount of load on your lower back. For your situation, that's a self-limiting problem in the sense that it flares and gets better and then it comes back. It's probably nothing concerning because again, the symptoms gradually resolve. Um, I think you have a very treatable problem with self-direction, you know, weight loss, exercise, diet, nutrition all the things that really contribute to spine health. Um, if you have no neurologic deficits or weakness, fever chills, things like that, I don't think imaging is even warranted, uh, but exercise and, and maintaining a, a good body mass index would be very, very important for you. We, what, what, we, yeah. we had a question come in uh, through the chat. Um, it's actually Dr. Chris Plasteris, who's one of my mentors uh, when I was doing my training at the University of Pennsylvania. So the question was uh, strategies on reopening the procedure suites and what types of changes will we make? Um, you know, we largely are following guidance from our governor in terms of elective cases, um, along with uh, New York Presbyterian, the hospital system. We do procedures both in the office and in the hospital ambulatory surgery setting. So most of the hospital-based procedures are still somewhat on hold other than for urgent situations. Um, we are slowly opening the procedure suite next week um, on May 11th. The way we are making some changes is, you know, we're eliminating the waiting room. So patients, when they come on arrival, they'll be taken straight to the procedure room. We've decreased our volume, whereas Dr. Matta and I usually do procedures together on the same day. And those days, historically, we're very busy. We would see 40 to 60 patients between us. Uh, now we're going to limit that to one patient per hour, and the reason we're doing that is so we can do the procedure, recover the patient, and have them discharged before the next patient comes. For granted, it's going to be inefficient for the time being, but that's, a, that's the sacrifice we're going to make to make sure that it's done safely. Um, along with PPE, masks, and gowns, and cleaning the rooms, uh, those are some of the strategies that we're looking towards. Now maybe a quick question. I, I know Ricky uh, and Neil talked about this a little bit, but I know a lot of people have questions about that. Tell me just in one or two sentences, the pros and cons and the indications for epidural steroid injections. When do they work and when not? What, 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 what are the big topics to talk about? Well, I, I think that the, this has been controversial for some time and you can even get into a debate of what type of steroid and what anatomical approach to use. But the overlying factor is that the, uh, the chronic or acute patient is probably the one that's more differentiating. The acute episode of pain is likely to respond the best with the sort of greatest uh, difference in pain and longevity. And those with sort of chronic spinal stenosis uh, for years with severe stenosis may get no benefit at all. Uh, and so, you know, those are... It's, it's a broad category. We think of it as sort of relatively low risk compared to some of the more uh, aggressive interventions out there, and that's why it remains being used. And, uh, and anything that allows the patient to gain mobility and function um, to get them back into more exercise and physical therapy is, is a win. Got it. Uh, if somebody responds to oral steroids, is that an indicator indication that they will respond to an epidural injection or one has nothing to do with the other? Uh, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I think that many of them do correlate well, but in the absence of a response to oral steroid, could they still respond to epidural? Yes, uh, of course, as well in that situation as well. We have, a we have, we have a, another question. Uh, Naomi, I've unmuted you. Hi everyone, Naomi Boyer, I'm a neurologist. Um, good to see everybody. I just had a few, um, you know, I was curious in terms of when you were discussing a little bit about exercise, the Peloton versus doing floor exercises and the challenges of that. Because, 
you know, meaning I always thought of bike in theory was ideal, right? Running is an issue and, you know, in terms of any cardio. So what, you know, I've been advising patients very frequently, you know, to use their bicycles. So what pros, cons, like what insights have you guys seen? Because I really like my thoughts, huh? <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, that question comes up a lot on how to exercise, especially in this new era. I don't, it's not a hard and fast rule that I don't like the soul cyclers or the pelotons or spinning. Mm -hmm. It's just that it has to be balanced with other types of exercise. You know, we see patients that just spin and those patients, especially if they're hunched over on the handlebars leaning forward, they put a lot of pressure on their lumbar spine, a lot of pressure on their tailbone, like Dr. Meta mentioned. Um, so they balance that with some core exercises on the floor, isometric types of things like planks, side mm -hmm. planks, leg raises where you're not having any dynamic motion of the lumbar spine, but still engaging those deep core muscles. Right. Um, I think spinning is fine. I think it can be a very effective way to increase your heart rate, build both aerobic and anaerobic capacity. So is a recumbent uh, bike better than in theory? Meaning if, it's like, if you had to recommend a bike? It depends on the condition. You know, if it's uh, someone who's got stenosis, I'd say spin because you're leaning forward, you're going to feel great. If someone with a disc herniation, I'd probably favor a more recumbent bike where you're upright or leaning back. Um, but that's where the history and physical exam really, really helps us make that decision. 100%. But mobility is medicine. I'm going to get that tattooed on my arm because I really believe in exercising as a way to prevent the need for us. Um, but that's a great question. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. There's also the neck problem, right? If somebody has a neck problem and they're leaning forward and looking up, that I see that a lot in patients. You know, that, that's probably not the best thing. And so in those patients, it's really better to have a recumbent bike, bike where they sit upwards and the neck is straight. Yeah. You know, uh, Ricky, are you good to do the deep breathing on the other arm or? <laughs> yeah, four, four, seven, eight over here and the <laughs> medicine over here. So we'll, uh, we'll finish up. We have a few more minutes. Uh, uh, we have, we have one more question one more from question Patricia for... Moda. Oh yeah. Patricia Moda, would you like to go ahead? Patricia, you're unmuted if you'd like to ask your question. I do see her question on the chat, so maybe that uh, it's how can we help pregnant women uh, with back pain? Um, Hello. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, there she is. Hello, I have a question about pregnant How would situation with the back pain? Hello? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I think that's a good Hello? question. Ricky or, or Neil? Sure. Yeah. So the, the question was about uh, um, back pain in pregnancy. You know, we see this quite often, yes. um, especially in the first and second trimesters. Again, as the abdominal girth kind of increases, there's a lot of pressure on the lumbar spine. Uh, one of the places we see it in women, uh, obviously pregnant women, but more so just even in women without pregnancy, um, is the sacroiliac joint. Uh, so one of the things that we try to recommend, because interventions aren't really an option for those patients, uh, taking a fluoroscopic x-ray injection is contraindicated. So working on some of those core and hip exercises, like I mentioned before, um, an SI belt uh, can be very, very protective. It stabilizes the SI joint in the lower back. Um, it also can take some of the pressure off the lower back by supporting the uterus. Um, but a great question. We see it often. Typically, as the pregnancy evolves in the third trimester, your body releases a hormone called relaxin, and that kind of loosens things up. And after delivery, a lot of the weight's gone. Um, it's, some, it's just one of those situations where you have to just ride it out. Uh, but there are some strategies and treatments that we could strongly recommend. Yeah, and, I, and I, to add to that, we, in really severe cases, we have done procedures. We just use ultrasound to avoid the use of x-ray, whether it's an epidural for disc herniation that can present or, uh, or also um, the, the uh, sacroiliac joint, as Dr. Singh was mentioning. Yeah, and, and we, in, in very, very rare and selected cases where patients had, pregnant women had significant neurological deficits, we've, we've even done uh, surgery. But again, that's, that's obviously something that's uh, very rare and, and should only be done if, if somebody has a severe neurological problem. Now, uh, before we finish up, I just want to reiterate that 
We're starting again next week. We made significant uh, adjustments in uh, the patient volume uh, to make sure that we can guarantee social distancing and safety for all patients and staff members in the in the spine center on 59th Street. Uh, so uh, there's no reason uh, not to send us a patient if, the, if that patient really needs to be seen, of course. I also want to, at this point, uh, I want to reiterate our pledge to our patients. Uh, we are interdisciplinary. That means that we use a multidisciplinary approach for diagnosis and for treatment. We will also to always try to, when it comes to any type of intervention, to use the least invasive approach. Uh, would it be an injection or any other pain management intervention or surgery? We do a lot of minimal invasive surgery, and we will always go from the least invasive but also the most effective surgical approach uh, that, that promises and that shows the best long-term results. We will always choose that for our patients, and we'll be with you before, during, and after uh, this whole journey. Now, uh, again, at the very end, these are my, uh, our contacts in the Spine Center. And if you have any questions, concerns, just uh, let us know. Hopefully you found this helpful. We'll send out the, the slide deck later and uh, be safe and take good care of your patients and contact us anytime if you have any questions or concerns. Okay, so thanks Ricky, Neil, uh, Josh, and uh, Roseanne and Tatiana for putting all this together. Thanks for asking questions and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. Have a good Thank you everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes.